Thanks for joining us at Bethel Assembly Online. We all face adversity every day, whether that's in the workplace or in our homes or in relationships. We want to encourage you that God's Word provides the tools that we need to overcome adversity. We want you to look into yourself and know that you have the ability to overcome them. So join us as we step into God's Word today. But if you remember last week, we kicked off a new series called Overcoming Adversity. And we talked about the story of David and Goliath. And we talked about adversity around every corner. We all face it. But we talked about this idea that we need to be ready for adversity. See, before we can really get into the measure of adversity and face those things, we've got to make sure we're ready. So we talked about some of those components. If you missed any of that, I want to encourage you to go to our website. You can check out uh, last week's message, and it'll set you up kind of in a greater way for being ready for adversity. So I want to challenge you to do that. But we're going to continue with another part of David's story today. So I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 22. All right, if you don't have a Bible, there's one in a seat pocket there in front of you. You can take that. That's our gift to you. All right, 1 Samuel is in the Old Testament. And as you turn there, I want you to get camped out here in 22 because we're going to be camped out on this passage of Scripture for a little while, okay? 1 Samuel 22 starting at verse 1. Here we go. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers in his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he began their, became their commander. About 400 men were with him. So I want you to put yourself in his shoes for a second. You have just beaten the Philistine, Goliath, all right? The warrior of all warriors. You just slayed him. You took him out. We talked about that last week. All right, you just killed Goliath, and now you are the war hero. Imagine you were the war hero of the country. You're the one who seemed so unlikely to face this kind of adversity, but you face the giant, you take him down, you are the champion, all right? You are coming into instant fame. You're the one that everybody wants to be around and have a picture with, right? All right? Imagine yourself there like David. You're the one that's there, but then something happens, something changes. Because imagine killing the Philistines' greatest warrior, all right? You think the Philistines are going to be a little upset with you? Yeah. So they begin to put a target on David's back. So they're not a big fan of him. And then with all the fame, we see King Saul, the current king of the time, he's now getting jealous of David's fame. He's getting frustrated with the kind of accolades this young man is getting. So he's getting frustrated. And so now with this, there's a price put on his head and there's many attempts at his life. Consider going from fame to fugitive. Consider going from the height of, you know, popularity and being someone that everybody wanted to be around to now you're at the bottom of the barrel and everybody is out to get you because the king and the Philistines, they're not a happy camper with you. So look at the first part of this verse again. 1 Samuel 22, 1. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. See, when adversity comes on us and this kind of adversity hits you, I don't know about you, but you'd probably be running too, Right? You'd probably be looking for the nearest cave to hide in. If everybody's out to get you and there is a bullseye on you, if there is a a, a warrant out for you, if there's a want poster out and it says, we want you and you're going to die, I don't know about you, but I'd be running. Anybody else? Everybody else is like, no, I'd face them. (laughs) Don't pretend like you're all courageous. All right, come on. All right, you'd be like me. You'd be running for the hills. You'd be running for a cave. You'd be going to find something to hide in because if you have that many people and these high up people going after you, you're going to look for somewhere to hide. And so adversity is hitting David in this new way. And now he's looking for a place to run and hide. And I think we would all do the same. Next week, I'm going to give you some keys that you can use when challenges come your way. So I don't want you to miss next week. But today, I want to give you some wisdom and encouragement that we see happening in David here in this passage of Scripture. There's some wisdom that we can obtain from him. See, the reality is is David knew when it was time to face Goliath. He knew when it was time to face him. He knew when it was time to step up to the adversity and face it head on. But now here we see David knowing when it was time to withdraw when it's time to withdraw from adversity. See, that's what wisdom does for us. See, we can always say, well, adversity comes, you just got to face it and head, it, head on and just get, you know, put up your, your fist and get ready for the fight. The truth is, though, is sometimes when adversity comes, we got to know when to step back and withdraw. We got to know when to take a time out. We got to know when to pause, and that takes wisdom. And we see wisdom here from David when he knows when to fight and knows when to step back. Some of us in the room that have short fuses, we struggle with that. We struggle with knowing when's the time to withdraw or when's the time to fight. 
David knew this well. Consider adversity, and we have to understand that the fact of when to face it and when to withdraw from it. How do we do this? How do we understand this? All right, so I don't know if you've ever seen or heard of, but there's this dictionary called the Urban Dictionary. Okay? All right? There's a term in there called school you. It means to teach someone something. If you've ever played basketball with somebody, I'm about to school you. Huh? Some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's okay. You can go further south and you'll start hearing it. All right? So there's this, this term, though, in the Urban Dictionary called school you, and it means to teach someone something. So to help you understand, let me put it in the context according to David. David says to Goliath, as you define my homie Big G, some of you get this later. <laughs> Goliath says to, to, to David, yeah. So David says to Goliath, I, I'm about to school you. <laughs> That's not proper English. I apologize. But this is the idea, the idea of being schooled. All right, you ever been schooled in something? You ever been taught something by somebody and you're like, oh, that, I just got schooled. Have you ever schooled somebody and you're like, yeah, I just schooled them. You know, there's this idea of understanding, though, that David had. He knew what side of school he was on. He knew when it was time to be the one teaching, and he went, then he knew when it was time to be the student. See, he knew what side of school to be on, and that was the wisdom that David had. He knew when it was time to school Goliath, take him on and fight the fight, and then there was times he knew when it was time to withdraw and be the student. That takes wisdom. It takes an understanding of our God. See, from this day forward, we see David in a season of his life where now he's no longer in fame, but he's just simply a fugitive. Why is this? Why would this happen? Why would he understand then to the, at this moment that it was time to not be the one schooling people and teaching them who God was, but it was now the time to withdraw to let God teach him something? David understood that God was taking him to school. David understood something about God that many and few really understand. Let me illustrate this for you. There's a book called The Tale of Three Kings by Gene Edwards. Phenomenal book. If you haven't read it, you need to get your hands on it. It's a small little book. It's an easy read, but it's an amazing story of character and heart that you will love. Anyway, let me read you this passage from this book. God has this school, the school of brokenness, because he does not have broken men and women. Instead, he has several other types of men and women. He has ones with, who claim to be God's authority and aren't. Ones who claim to be broken and aren't. And ones who are God's authority but who are mad and unbroken. And he has, regretfully, a spectroscopic mixture of everything in between. All of these he has abundance. But broken men, men and women hardly at all. So David understood something. And there's something amazing when we encounter adversity. We either know it's time to stand up and be the one to school them and take on the role of teacher and fight the fight. And there's sometimes the time where we have to withdraw and become the student and understand that God has taken us to the school of brokenness. See, God wants to break us sometimes. And David understood something about God in this. Is he understood that it was time to withdraw because all of this fame has now ended with him being a fugitive. And he understood something. He understood that there was a God in heaven and that he is in control. And this was a season of his life he needed to withdraw because there was something going on. Something bigger than him or something deeper within him. It was the school of brokenness. See, we're taught from a very young age. Careful. You could break something, right? We're taught that from a very young age. So when something happens, adversity comes, and hard times come, and brokenness was to come into our life, you know, not only physically, but spiritually, emotionally, and mentally, we don't want to be broken. We don't want that kind of experience. But yet, David had the wisdom to understand God was taking him through a process of school. Some of you in this room can relate quite well to brokenness. Some of you have been through some times. See, 1 Samuel 22, 1 again says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. See, Adullam in the original Hebrew text, it means refuge. It means refuge. So it's interesting that he's retreating to the cave of refuge. See, God can't let you come to the cave of refuge unless you're willing to be broken. Sometimes God's looking for people to be broken. Why is that? We're going to get into that in a minute. But the brokenness within us is huge. And we can't find 
refuge unless we're willing to go through a process of brokenness. Refuge comes in those moments. See, remember last week I showed you I showed you this uh, photograph from, if you can put it up on the screen, this photograph of when we were in Israel this year, my wife and I, and again, for those of you that maybe missed out last week, let me explain this real fast, is this valley here, right there, that creek bed that runs through it, that's where David and Goliath would have came together and they would have had their battle. Across the way where that you see that town of today, that was where Israel was camped out, the Philistines were on the opposite side. Now, what's interesting in this valley, if you would go down the valley and take a left and go up it, you would end up in Jerusalem and Bethlehem and all these great cities that that's where Israel was trying to keep them from going to, okay? So now David's come past. He's beat Goliath. All the fame is faded. He now has a a price on his head, so to speak. And as this goes by, he retreats to the cave of Adullam or the cave of refuge. Now, if you go to the next slide for me, that's where the cave of Adullam is located, is right on the other side of the valley. What's interesting to me is this. Have you ever had one of the greatest victories of your life and only to walk out every morning and be reminded of it? Think about it. So here's his greatest victory against Goliath. And every morning he steps out of the cave of Adullam. He's reminded of his greatest victory. And now he's in his greatest adversity. I'll tell you what, life's not easy sometimes, is it? It hits you upside the head. It sneaks up behind you. And when it hits you, you're just like, wait a second. This is what I was. This is where I am. This is what I thought I had. And now you're sitting here looking for refuge, trying to find hope in the day, trying to find hope in some existence and who you are. And when you step out of the cave, you're reminded every day, that's what I once was, but I'm not that anymore. That's adversity. And what adversity that does to you is that breaks you, doesn't it? It kind of just tears you down. It kind of makes you feel empty inside sometimes. And see, the thing is, is our God loves us enough to never waste a moment of adversity in your life. He'll never waste those moments when it comes that you're sitting in the cave of Adullam only looking out to see your greatest victory and being reminded of it every day. You once were this, but now you're this. God says, I can use this. I can use this in your life. I can use this to take you to the school of brokenness. And this was what was happening for David. Imagine that. Imagine you coming out of hiding every morning just to be reminded of your greatest victory. Come on, that's good. Somebody got to go, yeah, I know. I feel that way sometimes. I've had those seasons in my life. I'll tell you what, I know I have. I've had those moments where I feel like I'm hiding only to be reminded every day of what what I once was what I'm hiding from. God provides us refuge, though, in that brokenness, but it's a process that we have to go through. It's a process that we all have, must face. See, God wants to develop brokenness, brokenness in us, and he had to develop brokenness in David for him to become the king that he would eventually become. See, some of us in the room, we're called to greatness. Let me rephrase that. All of you are in the room called to greatness, but only some will achieve it. You know Why? Because you're afraid to go through brokenness. You're afraid to run to the cave of refuge. You're afraid to let God do something miraculous in you, but you're afraid it's going to hurt, so you push back from God. No, God, I thought when I serve you, it's supposed to be easy. (laughs) Whoever sold you that bill of goods, I'm sorry. Seriously, when you serve God, it's not easy. When you serve God, it doesn't make life a bowl of cherries. No, you still face adversity. But in God, you will find refuge in him if you're willing to go through the school of brokenness. But you have to be willing to take that school on. You have to be willing to become the student so that someday you can become the teacher. So that someday you can become the one who says, I'm going to school you now. But few of us are willing to go through that. And I really do believe that every one of you in this room is called to something great. Only some will achieve it because some aren't willing to go to the cave of refuge and find their brokenness. David was. And if you're wise enough to understand when you should fight and when you should withdraw, you will begin a process of brokenness and you will become somebody great. I promise you that. I see it in God's word time and time again. When he breaks us down, he builds us back up. And he will not allow a moment of adversity to come by to not be a part of shaping you so you take refuge in him. Why would he do this? Because brokenness develops a dependency on God. We naturally aren't dependent on God. We're dependent, we want to be dependent on ourselves. No, I got this handled, God. That's okay. Let me show you how it's done. Right? Anybody ever done that with God? 
Just a couple of us. The rest of everybody else is saints. You're awesome. Seriously, though, come on. We've done this. No, God, I got it handled. No, we're okay. I got it. But see, what God does is he takes us through the process so we develop a dependency on him. Rarely today, especially in America, do we have a dependency on him. And God's looking for us to say, you know what? I'm dependent upon you. I'll take refuge in you. I'll find my strong tower, my shelter within you. He's looking for people just to say, I'll lean into you, God. I'll find you and I'll hide within you. See, I want you to look at this. Psalm 57. David writes this psalm while he's in the cave of Adullam. He writes Psalms 57. Here's what he says. Verse 1. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. Hello? I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Often when disaster comes, we end up raising our fists to God and say, Why? And get angry with him. What does he want to teach us in that moment? Verse 2, I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. Verse, now skip down to verse 10. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of your, you among the peoples. 11, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. This is in the midst of being in the cave of refuge. This is in the midst of being in a disappointing place. This is in the midst of a painful process of brokenness. But yet what happens for us sometimes is that we like to what? Pout, don't we? Come on, you powders. I'm a powder, all right? I whine, I bicker, I complain. You know, when I'm in a horrible place, I'm like, God, why? Why? And I start whining and crying and moping. I love what David does here. He says, I will need your rescue. I, I'll take refuge in you. But God, I exalt you. <laughs> wow. You want to get through the school of brokenness a lot faster? Start worshiping God. You want to get through the school of brokenness a lot faster? Take heed and listen and learn and begin to exalt the creator of heaven and earth. He's still God on his throne even in your bad day. Even in your bad day, you'll pass the class a lot faster. <laughs> Often we think, don't we? Well, when I get out of the cave, I'll write something nice about you, God. <laughs> when I get out of the cave, I'll say something nice about you. When I get out of the cave, you know, I'll worship you. When I get out of the cave, I'll go to church. When I get out of the cave, I'll do this with my kids. When I get out of the cave, I'll do this in my marriage. When I get out of the cave, wait a second. God's looking for you to do something now in the cave. He's looking for you to go through the school of brokenness so you can do something amazing now. Go through the process. Don't skip the process because God wants to take you through it so that you can become the one that schools others and teaches them. You might feel like a fugitive right now, but you won't be forever. You might feel like you're hiding, but you won't be forever because remember, you're hiding within the cave of refuge. You're hiding within him. You're leaning into him. You're stepping under the shadow of the Most High. <laughs> See, when you're wise enough to know what side of the schooling you're on and you allow yourself to be broken, you take refuge in God and something amazing happens. I want you to look at it again, 1 Samuel 22, 1 through 2, the whole passage. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. Look at that first part there. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they came down to him. See, him and his family were estranged. They were separated. There were some issues going on. But see, when you go through brokenness and when you hide in God's refuge, those relationships that were once broken start to come back around. Some of you haven't been willing to be broken. Some of you haven't been willing to walk through that schooling. And if you are, I promise you, you'll see relationships that were once a strain, they'll become whole again. But you have to lean into God because God says, you know what? I need relationship with you. Put your dependency and refuge in me. And then all the other peripherals, all the other relationships, I'll put them into play. I'll put them back in right. Some of you are sitting here today and you feel like you don't have a relationship with this person or that person or you feel like there's pressure here or there's pressure there. I want to encourage you, lean into the refuge of the Lord and let God do the work in the relationships. You'll see them come together over time. Don't give up on that. Don't be disheartened in it. Lift your eyes up to the Lord and find your encouragement today.
All right? Second part we look at here is all those who were in distress. Their own lives weren't very easy and they weren't all together. Their lives weren't all fixed and pretty and nice. They had problems of their own. Yet God called them to the cave of Adullam with David. See, when you find yourself in God's schooling of brokenness and you take refuge in him, there's going to be people that will come to you that are in distress. When you find refuge in God, people will come to you in their distress and look for their refuge. But see, often when we have distress, we don't take refuge in him. And so when, instead of being attracting to, to people about God, we begin to repel people, don't we? And see, what God is looking for us to do is go through the school of brokenness so that we become attractive to people and people are drawn to us and they're drawn to the God within us. There's de- distressed people all around us, aren't there? And you might feel like one of them today. But I'll tell you something. God is saying, take refuge in me, and I will draw those who are distressed to the cave of Adullam, to the cave of refuge. See, God is looking for a people that will walk in refuge and walk in brokenness so that others will understand and know and come. See, David couldn't understand those who were in distress if he wasn't in distress. He couldn't understand it. And those moments when you've been in distress and you've gone through those painful moments where you find yourself all alone and you're disappointed and you find yourself broken, those are the moments when God says, okay, now I have you where you, I need you and now I can let you be sympathetic to those that need, need my peace and my presence. You can't be sympathetic to people unless you've been in distress. Can you? Come on. Say Yeah. Just making sure you're all awake. You guys are awfully quiet this morning. The sun's shining. The birds are chirping. Come on now. All right? You guys got to cheer up a little bit or drink some more coffee. Now look at this. The next part, in debt. These people haven't seen a lot of success. And there's been moments, I don't know about you, but I've had moments where I'm like, wow, is there ever success here? Is there ever going to be a, a, you know, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? Is, there, is this going to ever pan out? When we've been in those moments where we have been lacking success, we understand those who have or are lacking success. And I'm not just talking financially, but emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Those who aren't walking in success, they will understand and they will come to you when you're hiding in the cave of refuge. And guess what? They will find refuge with you because you are saying, my refuge is in God. My success does not come from what I accomplished just by my hands, but my success comes from my relationship with God. See, people are looking for authenticity with God. And they can't find it unless you're willing to go through the school of brokenness. See, you know what I understand? I'm in debt. In more ways than one. But I'm in debt. And I'm in debt to the Most High. Because of what Jesus did on the cross for me. I'm in debt. You know what? I couldn't arrive to heaven on my own. It's through the free gift of Jesus Christ that I can walk into heaven and I can say, and I can hear and I can love on him and I'll hear him say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. It's because I recognize that I'm in debt and I have lacked success in my own well-being and I find success in him. Amen. Look for success in the Lord and others will come to you in their debt and they will look for the same success. Are you hearing what I'm saying, church? You're the vessel for the success. You're the vessel to bring people out of their debt. God wants to use you in that. He'll bring you to the cave of a dome and he'll bring others around you. Now I want you to look at the next part. Discontented, the discontented gathered around him. Discontented, all right, in the Hebrew means bitter of soul. Bitter of soul. That just sounds rough, doesn't it? I'm bitter in soul. (laughs) You walk up to somebody, hey, I'm bitter in soul. Look at your neighbor, say bitter. You say, look at him, say, you're bitter. Anybody ever been, some of you are taking too much pleasure in that. You ever been bitter about life? You ever been bitter in your heart? You've ever been bitter because of what somebody did to you? Have you ever been bitter because you felt like you didn't get the promotion at work that you should have gotten? You ever been bitter with someone because they took something and twisted it on you? You ever been bitter because somebody used something against you? You ever been bitter? See, discontented people are looking 
to find content, but they'll never find it unless they come to the cave of refuge in the presence of God and allow themselves to be broken and find hope again. But see, that doesn't happen very well unless there's somebody already in the cave saying, here's the way to brokenness. Here's the way to wholeness. Here's the way to refuge. See, it's kind of weird, isn't it? You can't find wholeness unless you're willing to go through brokenness. You'll find it if you're willing to come to the refuge of the Lord. There are distressed people in this room. There are distressed people in our neighborhood. There are distressed people that are bitter because of the way life dealt them their hand. They're bitter because of this. They're bitter because of that. And you work with people every day, and you are around people in your home that are like that. And I'm telling you, God has set you up so that you will take refuge in him. And he sets you up so he can show others how to take refuge in him through you. It's because of distress and because of my debt and because of my discontented heart that I have sympathy for those that are hurting. And see, when we recognize that we are discontented, when we recognize we've had moments of bitterness in our heart, when we recognize that we're in debt, when we recognize that we're in distress, we then take that sympathy upon others and we show them to the cave of refuge. When I find somebody who is not sympathetic to somebody's plight, I see someone who yet has discovered their own distress, their own debt, and their own discontentedness. They're lacking something here with him. And those who are merciful and kind and loving and gentle, they've been in the cave of refuge and they've been broken. And see, David couldn't become the king that he would later become unless he came to the cave of refuge in his brokenness. See, last week we talked about the fight and taking it to the adversity, right? This week's about knowing when to withdraw and find refuge in God. Some of you this morning need to do that. Some of you this morning need to understand that this is not the moment to put up the fists and fight. This is the moment to withdraw because God wants to teach you something, and it's his brokenness, so that you can understand the brokenness of others and so that you can bring peace and love and most of all, the refuge of the Lord because he's readily available, but few of us are willing to walk through it Few of us are willing to walk into it because we don't want to learn this because it's painful. I want to remind you of something, though. Look at First Chronicles 12. This is a powerful passage, and this is in reference to David and what is referred to as the men that were with him, that were discontented, distressed, and in debt. This is what it says, First Chronicles 12, 8. Mighty men of valor, what a change. Men trained for battle, who could handle shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lions. And were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. <laughs> Mighty men of valor. See, the thing is, you might walk into the cave in refuge looking for it. You might walk in in brokenness. You might walk in distressed and debt and discontented and bitter in soul. But I'll tell you something. When you walk out of the cave, when God's done what he needs to do in you, you will walk out mighty men and women of valor. You'll walk out ready for the fight. You'll walk out ready to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in you and through you. Come on, somebody better get excited about that because that's amazing. If we're willing to walk into the brokenness, if we're willing to walk into the cave, we will walk out and someday, somewhere, somehow, we will find ourselves mighty men and women of valor. We'll walk out changed. God wants to change you. God wants to prepare you. It's a different way of approaching adversity. It's not fighting through it every day. Sometimes you gotta know when to withdraw. And we gotta take the wisdom from David here. And get ready because God has something great to do within you. Amen? Tell you what, when we're wise enough to be willing to go through schooling and willing to understand what side of schooling we're on, we're not the one schooling them. We're the one getting schooled by the Lord. We walk into the cave of refuge and we take refuge in him. Something happens and something changes within us. See, the thing is, is what I love about Bethel is that anybody's willing to walk in, is able to walk into this place. Anybody. 
We have doctors. We have lawyers. We have law enforcement here. But you know what else we have in our church? We got people that have been in prison. We got people that have had some rough past in history. And you know what? They're just as valuable as anyone else. And it doesn't matter your history or your past. What it matters is where God's taken you. That's what I love about this church. There's such a diversity here. And what I love about it is we've been placed on top of a hill in North Rapid, and we've been placed here for a reason. And we've been placed here for a season so that we can do something and we can affect change. See, there's people in our community every day outside these four walls that are making a difference in our neighborhood. They're affecting change because you know what? There's probably been moments in their life where they've had distress and debt and hurt. And they see it all around them, so they want to make a difference, and they want to make a change. Today, we get to partner with that change, and we get to partner with those that are in our community, boots on the ground, they are saying, we're going to make a difference. So let me introduce you to them on this video. Good morning. We are here at General Beadle Elementary just down the hill from our church, and we are doing something new and exciting this year. We're going to be partnering with uh, Principal Kerry Davis, and we're going to be working with the four kindergarten classes that they have here on location. And we're going to be doing some exciting things, building a relationship. We're going to be uh, loving and blessing the teachers, and we're going to be doing all kinds of things. But uh, Principal Davis, I'm just going to let you share a little bit of yourself and your heart for the community here. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Carrie Davis, principal at General Beetle. This will be the start of my fifth year here at General Beetle. And it takes a while to get used to the population, the kids, and just the makeup of this community. And now I've grown to love it. Five years is just awesome. I'm already getting goosebumps. Um, and I haven't even said anything hardly yet. Right outside, we're doing garden stuff. We are working with our kids constantly, having classes. Last year, one of the things I'm very passionate about is getting our kids to school because we can't teach them if we can't get them to school. So just pushing to get those kids to school, build relationships, have them here and growing every day all the time. And I have wonderful teachers. And so if we can get them here and get going. Kindergarten is one of the best probably because that's where you're trying to build that relationship, that first start of getting them into school and loving their teacher and loving school. And I have some awesome teachers in kindergarten. So you picked a good group to work with. They are fantastic. They will love this and be able to help maybe you get to know some of the kids or anybody else who comes in and just that support that they get because they don't always have some of the things that they need such as just a mentor or somebody to care about them or tell them that they love them I mean that's a weird thing you don't think about it all the time because you probably say that all the time to, to your wife to your kids anytime but our kids don't have that so even just to give them a hug and support and so then your congregation by supporting our teachers in that effort even just to help them to buy school supplies anything like that they need those kind of things at christmas we're always buying them gifts clothing gift cards anything like that I, it's just about doing what we can for those kids and being there for them that's really what it's all about and educating them <laughs> that's very 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 important because we want them to know to get out of the cycle to change and to grow and to find something for themselves for somebody that would be debating whether to get involved or help or take the next step, what's some of the rewarding things that you've seen here after five years that would be an encouragement to somebody to say, you know what, I could probably help out a little bit more? You know, and maybe I should tell people that more often even, because a lot of times I'm like, oh, come volunteer. We would love to have you volunteer. But yeah, I've never thought about how does the kid respond to that. And our kiddos, if you saw their faces, they just, they light up when they get to know you. You have to get to know them. Fifth grade is one great example. It's taken me well, four years, because they're gone now, four years to really get to know them. But when you really make that connection with them, they just light up when they see you. They want to tell you things. They want to talk to you. And there's not a lot of trust with a lot of our kiddos. And that's any kiddos, anywhere. You know, that you really have to build that trust so that they understand that they can confide in you and tell you about what they're doing at, at home or at school and be excited about it. And they, they just light up. That's the best. I mean, there's so many other things when they just, you see them and they're happy and they're doing well and they listen to you and you tell them, you know, hey, maybe you shouldn't do something like that. But when they light up because they want to talk to you and they want to come to you and say hello, that's awesome. It's just rewarding, just that piece. It's that's simple, true. but yeah, it's absolutely. simple, easy, it's wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for letting us partner with your school and we are looking forward to this year. And again, um, Thank you for taking the time to be with us. So we're so appreciative of that. 
Uh, thanks for being with us again. We're here at General Beadle on location, and we just got to talk with uh, Principal Davis, and we're here with Morgan Von Hayden, and she is the coordinator for the school that connects people in the community to great things going on here at the school. Why don't you share a little bit about what you do and all the different resources you bring to the table? Well, thank you. Well, this is very exciting. Just, oh, what an awesome opportunity this is to work with you guys. But through the General Beadle and all of our community schools, we have lots of things happening. We do family nights once a month on Fridays. We're able to offer classes to our parents. We um, have a garden that we're always looking for help in our garden. We also have Feeding South Dakota that comes to our school. And it's truly bringing the community and the outside world, because education just doesn't stop at 2.30 when school is done. It continues all the time. So we want to be able to bring that to our families, to our kids, so it's a very well-rounded and a welcoming place. Just to give you a little few things that we're going to be doing is we're going to, you know, before school starts, they always have this kind of this service week where they're, all the teachers are working and uh, getting ready for their classrooms and all those things. And so we are going to cater lunch for them that whole week as they're getting ready for school, and we want to bless them that way. Every month following, I don't know about you, but uh, I love donuts, and uh, we're going to give donuts to put that in the teacher's lounge for them every month. Uh, when they have special events, we're going to help them out. We're going to volunteer and help serve the school through special events. We're going to be then, one of my favorite things is that with the four, Sunday, uh, with the four uh, kindergarten classes that we're adopting, we're giving every teacher a $200 gift card to Walmart because the thing is is so many teachers are spending their own money to help a kid to get resources or supplies or whatever it is. And I know we partner with organizations like Love Inc. that do a lot of that stuff, but we're going to just connect directly into the school in addition to this, okay? And one of the things that's amazing is when those teachers have spent all that money, they're going to bring their receipts back and we're going to reload the card for them so that they can make it through the year and they can bless those kids in their classroom. We're going to help them with uh, Christmas parties. We're going to help them with different events like that. And we're going to talk through some of this, but on Friday nights, once a month, you heard that mentioned that uh, they have stuff for parents and for families, and we're going to help be a resource for volunteers for them. Uh, there are kids that need to be read to. Uh, Morgan, the one that you saw there at the end there uh, with the yellow shirt, she said, you know, my goal, she goes, can I tell you my dream? I loved it when she said that. I'm like, yeah, tell me your dream. She's like, I want to see every kid have somebody reading with them every kid. So guess what? We can help do that. We can help meet that goal. We can help meet that dream. And you know what? These teachers in this school is making a difference right here in our neighborhood. And you know what? We're going to help affect change because you know what? Sometime, sometime, somewhere, somebody took time with us. Let's take time with them. So you know what? Would you welcome to the platform Principal Davis and some of her teachers? Come on up here, guys. I think it's great that they would spend a Sunday morning coming and hanging out with us, huh? This is pretty cool. Uh, tell you what, it was fun to get to know them and talk with them down at the school, uh, Principal Davis. Um, would you, I'm gonna, I know you got a couple of your teachers with you. I'm going to have you introduce them real quick to our, to our crew here. Good morning. I'm Carrie Davis. Thank you very much for wel welcoming us. I'm so nervous now. This is such an awesome opportunity. Teresa Keller, she's going to be kindergarten teacher, and Deb Daly, kindergarten teacher. Two others of mine, I have a brand new kindergarten teacher, then we, she's not here, and another one, I think she went on a trip, so she's not here. We've got two of the four. Awesome. Awesome. So Deb and Teresa. Very cool. Um, a couple things that we, we want to start getting you hooked up. So Principal Davis, that's for you. That's just a gift from us just to say thanks, because you opened the door to the school to say, you know what, come in and partner with us. Um, you know, here's your first 200 bucks, okay? So we want to bless you with it, absolutely. <laughs> you don't have to talk, it's okay. Uh, but you know what, and, and ladies, and you can tell the other kindergarten teachers that aren't here, but when you guys run out, come see us, okay? We'll reload them, okay? Because we want you to be able to be there, and we, here's the thing. They need to be the heroes to the kids. Amen? So we want you to be the heroes, and we're going to make you look like the heroes of every way we can. Okay? Yeah. Um, can we do this? Would you mind? Can we pray for you guys? Would you guys be all right with that? We just want to pray for you. Would you guys stand with me this morning? And we're just going to pray for you. And uh, we're honored that you would let us partner with you. And um, we're honored that you would let us come beside you. And we just want to help be support in the background. We want to bless you guys. And uh, anything you need, you let us know. And we'll do everything in our power to make it happen, okay? All right? 
we want to empower you so you got the resources and extra things and manpower that you need, okay? Let's pray for them, okay, guys? Lord, we thank you for these amazing teachers. We thank you for Principal Davis. We thank you that they would let us come in and be a partner with them. God, I pray a blessing over them personally and over their families and over their homes. And God, I pray that you would bless their, their kids and their school year ahead of them. God, I pray you even prepare the students even now for what's ahead of them. And God, we thank you that we get to partner with them. And Lord, I pray a special blessing over them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we thank them one more time? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hold on one second here before we go, all right? What we're going to do is there are sign-ups out in the foyer, okay? And we have categories that you can, we just want you to put your name and contact information down. There are categories that you can sign up for. If you want to read with a kid, if you want to help with the Friday night program and be a volunteer for that, or if you want to help with special events, if you want to help with the, the lunch that we're going to cater, if you want to help with uh, just cleaning up or painting or helping around the school with anything like that, there are categories that you can check the box next to. If you want to do them all, awesome, okay? But you can check the box to that. But please don't leave without saying, you know what, I can do something this year. I can help out in some way or form with General Beetle because we're going to make an impact because you know what? Our club program has done a lot of great things over the years and you know what? A lot of those kids that we've ministered to on Wednesday Night Club, they're the same kids that are at the school. So we're going to be making connections and inroads in new ways and new formats. So let me pray a blessing over you guys, and let's go and let's make a difference in General Beetle. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for everyone in this room. I pray that you go with them and you go behind them. And God, you give them everything that they need. And Lord, today I pray that we can celebrate you, we can love you with everything we do, and especially in our action. God, help us to be an agent of change. And help us, Lord, to help those that have been in distress and hurt and pain in their life. And help us relate to them, God, through our pain and through our distress and our brokenness. God, we thank you for what you you're doing and what you will do through this friendship and partnership. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. Blessings on you. Have a great Sunday. Don't forget to sign up on your way out. God bless.